However, today, I want us to consider the bread. So this is going to be a tale of two breads, in which we will look at a couple of unique aspects of bread. The significance of bread. Let us look at how significant bread was to the people of biblical days. It was crucial in many ways. Bread was the most important part of their diet. It was eaten with every meal. It was so common that the term break bread meant to eat a meal. And the words bread and food were virtually synonymous. In traveling, it was common to take bread to sustain oneself. A considerable part of the typical woman's day was occupied with grinding grain to make flour and then baking bread with that flour. Bread was a very key part of life throughout the day. It meant everything to the people of that time. Bread sustained their lives. Without bread, a person went hungry or starved. We see this reflected in part of the model prayer given by Jesus, give us this day our daily bread. Bread was crucial to the people, which is why we find it mentioned around 60 times in the Gospels and about 330 times throughout the whole Bible. So the first bread I want to talk about is the bread made with leaven. The imagery of leavening makes all the more sense when you know how leavening was done in ancient times before the little red star packages came along. Whenever grain or flour is allowed to get moist, within a few days it will acquire a sour taste and start to ferment uh, because of the microbes that are in the air and it will cause the grain to decay. Without steps taken to prevent it, it will always occur over time. Somewhere back in ancient times, someone discovered that if you make dough while the grain is still edible and bake it, the acid and bubbles produced by the microbes would add texture and flavor to the bread. This normally takes days before it would occur naturally, but it can be hastened by inoculating the dough with an older lump of raw dough. Sourdough breads are still made this way today. Over a few days, the lump of dough would become sour and in inedible. And if left longer, it would become rancid and rotten. But yet, it was mixed into a new batch of dough to cause it to rise. In light of the ancient bread making, leavening becomes an even more potent image of a life contaminated by sin. The decay that leads to death or rottenness is added to each batch. Without it, the dough tends to be sweet, but adding it would give the dough a slightly sour taste and it would get stronger and stronger and until it was baked. The rise of dough is only possible by the means of natural processes of decay. Hmm. Notice how sin tends to sour our personalities and also causes us to puff up with pride. Eventually, as Adam first found out, sin leads to our decay and death. What does leavening symbolize? Believe it or not, the Bible actually gives us multiple explanations. Leaven is almost always symbolic of sin. Like leaven, which permeates the whole lump of dough, sin will spread in a church or a person, or a nation. 
eventually overwhelming and bringing its participants into bondage and eventually to death. It is a symbol of hypocrisy and disobedience. If you turn to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 6, and Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus wasn't talking about bread as his disciples first thought, but the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, or the hypocrisy that they demonstrated. However, there are some circumstances or instances where leavening in the Bible is not associated with evil, as in the parable of the leaven. When we purge the leaven from our homes, as we have done this past week, we are sanctifying ourselves by removing corrupt influence out of our lives. Spiritually, we are removing sin from our lives. That's what it represents. Notice that principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So let's look at the other bread, this unleavened bread. Unleavened bread is a very flat and plain, and it was seen to represent humility rather than being puffed up with pride. Because it is just wheat and water with no old fermented leavened dough added, it represented purity. Unleavened bread, bread made without leavening, is mentioned in the Bible as something pure and unpolluted. All the grain sacrifices to be burned were to be made without leaven. As in Leviticus chapter 2 states, verse 11, No grain offering which you bring to the eternal shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey, in an offering to the eternal made by fire. That's Leviticus 2, verse 11. It was specified that leavened bread was almost never to be involved with sacrifices. I say that because there were times when leavened bread was offered to represent the thanksgiving of the people. For example, in Leviticus chapter 7, verse 13, besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offering. <clears throat> Leviticus 23, verse 17. We already know we're talking in that chapter, we're talking about the holy days. Verse 17 reads, Ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be of fine flour, they shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the eternal. As you know, this is talking about Pentecost. There are many different offerings that were presented to the temple on the day of Pentecost. After the regular morning sacrifice, there was a burnt offering followed by a meal offering and a drink offering. After that, there was a sin offering and then the climactic offering of the day or fellowship, or the peace offering of two lambs, each a year old, 
waved before the eternal, together with the two loaves which were baked with leavening. This peace offering was not offered on the altar. It was given to the priest. It could not be placed on the altar or on the fire, as I read previously, because the loaves were baked with leaven. Leaven thus represents the works of the people here, which they offer to God with thanksgiving. On the other hand, the connection of unleavened bread to sacrifice shows the pentanal attitude that the people are expected to have towards the sacrifice and a remembrance that forgiveness is the eternal's rather than a work of their own. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul explains the spiritual symbolism of unleavened bread which we already saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, rebuking the church members because in Corinth because of their acceptance of a sin that was being done there. He tells them, your glory is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are leavened unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. <laughs> yes, as Paul states, it is a sacrifice of Jesus Christ that removes our sins, so that we become unleavened in a spiritual sense. So again, Jesus Christ is the focus of this feast of the eternal. The shadow of this feast of Unleavened bread points to what Jesus would do for all of us in cleansing us of sin and helping us all to live sin-free lives. A person who is unleavened is like the character that is described in the Beatitudes, meek and pure-hearted, aware of their own weaknesses, who comes to God honestly without pretense. In contrast, leaven was seen to picture pride, boastfulness, hypocrisy, of being full of oneself, the opposite of being poor in spirit. When God prohibited his people many years earlier from eating leaven during Passover, he was thinking ahead to when Jesus would use the bread at Passover meal to describe himself. Because he was not leavened with sin, he was a suitable sacrifice. And because he was not infected with decay, he is God's Holy One who will not see decay and live on eternally. As mentioned in Psalms 16, verse 10, and Psalms 49, verse 9, which Paul actually uses in a sermon that he gives in Acts chapter 13. Christ's body saw no decay in the tomb. We all know the story of Lazarus, who was dead for three days. There was a smell of decay when Christ opened up the tomb. However, when Peter and John went into the empty tomb after three days, there's no mention of any smell. Christ did not, his body did not decay to fulfill the scriptures. By using this imagery of unleavened bread, Jesus is saying another thing about himself, that he was fit as a sacrificial offering because he was free of loving. All animal sacrifices offered up to God had to be without blemish. And any grain offered to the eternal had to be free of loving. Jesus Christ is our unleavened Savior. In light of this, we can appreciate all the more what Jesus meant when he held up the piece of unleavened bread and said, 
this is my body. He wasn't just speaking about his body as the bread in general, but a specific kind of bread made without leaven, unadulterated by decay. Unlike the rest of humanity who are leavened with sin, he was not affected with the rottenness that is in the rest of mankind. So what is Jesus Christ's point in calling himself the true bread from heaven, the bread of God, and the bread of life? He's saying that just as physical bread is essential for physical life, as I had mentioned before, he, as the bread of God, and the bread from heaven, and the bread of life, is essential for our spiritual and eternal life. Without him, we do not have, or cannot have, eternal life. <clears throat> 